Hello, one of these people are you. You've had a long day at school, or was it the office? Maybe you were shopping. Now you are home. Ah, relax. Maybe you want to watch television. These people live in constant fear of eviction. They had already been forced See out what's on. Slums. In this place, people die so we can get mobile phones. You've heard it all before, haven't you? Children working as slaves. To you feel a mixture of sorrow and cynicism. The world is richer than it has ever been, and yet there seems to be more poor people than ever. Economies have been on the edge of a financial and economic precipice. You are falling asleep. You're going to have a strange dream. It starts with this thought. If we want to make poverty history, then first we need to understand the history of poverty. Your dream starts in a library full of floating books. There are voices that seem to come from the books and speak to you. Poverty, wealth, power, powerlessness are connected. Poverty isn't solved automatically by growth. What can we do for them or what do they need? That's a question which is a little too, too general in a sense, because uh, there is no one answer. You are a prehistoric girl or boy, you choose, and this is your family. Dad doesn't have a car, mom doesn't have a fridge, and you don't have an iPod. But there are plenty of wild animals. So you are trying to work out if you are rich or poor at the start of human history. At least everyone seems equal. You're hungry, so Dad gets dinner. If you wanted to write a, a big history of poverty, you could divide it into three or four different um, chapters. And you would start, perhaps, with the hunter-gatherer. A hunter-gathering lifestyle has a lot of great advantages. It really takes very little labor to gather enough food, enough calories to live. And to that extent, if what you like doing is lying on a beach in a nice place, it's a wonderful lifestyle. But it is not a lifestyle that is secure. The mood of your dream changes. The ice age has come, and you don't have central heating in your cave. So you get frozen very quickly. Perfectly preserved for a future museum exhibit titled Poor Man. The insecurity of a hunter-gathering lifestyle is that, yes, you could die suddenly. What if? There um, is a sudden change in climate. What if there's a sudden animal flu that um, kills off the livestock you're, you're, you, you live off of? The ability to actually plan for and build in a response to those kinds of changes is almost impossible. So much for poverty in the Stone Age, with no food or medicine. You died before you could find out much about it. Now your soul floats over the world's early civilizations. See all the millions of little farmers with their little fields and little huts. Everything looks poor, except for the one or two palaces where the kings and chiefs, the billionaires of ancient history, lived. 
virtually everybody in the world was poor. Uh, poverty uh, meaning uh, lack of reliable access to basic needs, uh, whether it's food uh, or water or at least the best uh, known health technology of the day uh, eluded 90% of the world's population. Life expectancy was on the order of 35 years uh, just about everywhere in the world, less than half our current lifespan. Virtually every community in the world, uh, even in the most uh, advanced societies, were subject to repeated famine. So, now you know you are going to be poor for a long, long time. But history has a new concept that can help you. Charity. Charity. All the world's religions offer it. But which one has the best deal? You find yourself bang in the middle of the Middle Ages and the Middle East. In a strange room, there are planks of wood, saws, hammers, and menorah. You must be a Jewish carpenter. You start barricading the door, but why? In urban areas, and for example, in a city such as Cairo, which would have been a population in the late Middle Ages of 200, 250,000 people, there were large numbers of people who slept out of doors. Uh, there were also people who, who slept in very primitive uh, or simple accommodations, people who, who lived in small huts, uh, people who lived in tents, uh, people who slept in ditches or on benches by the side of the road. You aren't that poor yet. But you might be. You owe money in taxes. Soldiers might arrest you. Then how would you and your family survive? During the Friday prayer, the beggars would line up outside the mosque. Sometimes wouldn't even bother to go in and pray, but they would line outside the mosque. And when the worshippers would come out from the Friday prayer, uh, they would beg. Nobody thought that you would abolish poverty. Poverty was simply accepted as a fact of life. Charity is a good deed. Uh, if you give alms to the poor, this is a way of in a sense, making up for your own sins and bad deeds. A single act of charity closes 70 gates of evil. The only gift is giving to the poor. All else is exchange. The wise one, rejoicing in charity, becomes thereby happy in the beyond. So you begin to write a letter to your local rabbi. I've never asked for money from anyone but I have debts owed to Muslims. I'm in hiding. I'm watching my children and my old mother starve. I throw myself before God and you to help me. Open up. Open up. Help, help, oh God, save me from the tax collectors. And look at yourself now. You are the ruler of a Latin American civilization, the Incas. You were rich, but you are about to become poor, faster than anyone else in history. The era of colonialism has begun. The Spanish have conquered your country. If you fill this room with gold, they won't kill you, so they say. Poverty is the consequence of plunder. Behind uh, every single form of modern poverty, you find the use of force. Now you have been put in prison. You see your people are dying. The colonizers brought new diseases with them. Influenza, syphilis, that are killing half your people. Europeans made Latin America poorer in many ways. Their land was taken from them. They were displaced. They didn't have the means to sustain themselves, and they were obliged to work in the plantations, in the haciendas, in the mines, so that they could extract uh, the silver and gold which Europeans valued. This is what uh, turned uh, vast numbers of uh, Latin American peoples into effectively the wretched of the earth. The Inca emperor has his own dream within your dream. The world does not look like it does today. Europe is not yet much richer than anywhere else. You wonder how all that changed. 
Latin America offers a clue. European colonizers are laying the foundations of modern poverty. You look through the clouds at Africa, trying to see if they are hungry yet. West Africans were economically savvy. Those who participated in economic productivity or economic production were numerous, especially the ordinary people. And when the Portuguese showed up at the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century, the Swahili societies from Mogadishu all the way to Kilwa off the coast of Mozambique were at the height of their history in terms of their commercial civilization to the point that the Portuguese sailors looked at these coastal towns bustling with economic activity and they felt that, you know, we, we need to take over. In many communities, land was relatively abundant and by accounts of missionaries and soldiers, they rated Congo's agriculture as more productive than Portugal's. And in the area of two crafts or industries, one was textiles, the other was iron making. They considered these equal to the best in Europe. When you look at uh, this phenomenon in terms of planetary history, Europe until, the, until 1492, more or less, was uh, a, a peripheral part of the world system. Uh, in that respect, uh, uh, you could say it was relatively poor, uh, and so on and so forth. But that wasn't the case uh, everywhere else. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at Africa, Asia, and America, uh, you will have seen uh, societies thriving in their own terms. Then afterwards, that situation changes radically. An iron ring around your neck. You, the emperor of the Incas, are being executed. The technical term for this painful death is garote. See? And you feel yourself falling, then crawling through the center of the world. You emerge on the other side, in China. A young girl in a huge field. Dry Nothing can grow here. Dry there could be a famine. And yet you feel safe in China. From the times of the earliest records, uh, Famine prevention, flood control, were considered to be the essential task of the rulers. The 1743 famine was famous because uh, there was a model relief effort uh, undertaken in that crisis. When this crisis occurred, first of all, there was a weather report. So they knew in advance drought is predictable because it doesn't uh, just come suddenly. It develops from the lack of rain over a period of months. So they knew that a drought was coming. The granaries were full. In this famine, it is possible that two million people were recipients of grain relief. You have been saved from death by famine. Lucky you are not in the West, but in the East. In a well-governed country, poverty is something to be ashamed of. In a badly governed country, wealth is something to be ashamed of. China in the last, say, two centuries, 19th and 20th centuries, has been poor and been regarded as poor. But since Marco Polo's time, uh, all the way through the 18th century, those Europeans who had any con direct contact with China were terribly impressed with its wealth and did not regard it as a, a backward country. The European states were much smaller in scale. They didn't have state-operated granary systems. They had a different political ideology, so it isn't so much could they have done it, would they have wanted to, and they didn't. You are on a cart with all your family's belongings piled high. The start of a new journey for you. Your father tells you that he is fed up with the pre-modern poverty and scraping a living off the land. He sold his little farm to a big landowner for a few coins. And all your neighbors, that is, have done the same that process of moving from a community form of agriculture where a whole village 
participate in the process and define themselves as uh, almost an agricultural collective to one in which you have essentially capitalist land holding and individual farms. You can view it either as a land grab by the rich or a, a um, process of creating a greater and more efficient system. It was both. Ich würde sagen, dass die Armut also zwei frühere Phasen gehabt hat. Eine Phase, eine sehr lange und große Phase, wo die Menschen im Wesentlichen in ländlichen Regionen gewohnt haben. Die zweite Phase ist dann die Phase, wo sich große Städte gebildet haben und in diesen Städten zum ersten Mal wirklich große Ungleichheiten aufgetreten sind, wo also sozusagen das Problem der relativen Armut, des Beieinanderseins von Reichen und Armen zum Problem wurde. Welcome to a city in the age of industry. You are spending the next 200 years toiling away, 10 hours a day. The machines get faster and faster, and you feel you are working harder and harder to keep up. In the first decades of the Industrial Revolution, there wasn't much increase of living standards of those in the industrial labor force. These were the satanic mills. Uh, there was a mass child labor, and, and uh, it was a pretty horrible scene. But the Industrial Revolution has set the world on a course of huge reductions of extreme poverty. What was 90% of the world in 1800, as of uh, 2011, might be something on the order of 15 to 20% of the world uh, accurately judged to be living in extreme poverty. That's human progress. You are a 12-year-old cloth worker. You spin wool with a hundred other boys. The bus stops you and points to the door. There is no work for you anymore. War has disrupted your markets. Your factory cannot deliver the yarn to the weavers. What you end up with is an entirely different kind of risk environment. Risk that comes from having to have moved across the country, perhaps, for a specialist job. What happens when the kind of machine you're used to working on ceases to be the most up-to-date and is replaced? All of that creates a kind of insecurity that is new. You pass the street workers of your city, the chimney sweeps, matchbox sellers, beggars, and prostitutes. You're scared. The important people in top hats have a new way of helping the poor. The workhouse is a machine for grinding rogues honest. One of the great responses to poverty, and urban poverty in particular, was the workhouse or the poorhouse. Most of them start off trying to be punitive. They start off thinking that they're going to have lots of able-bodied men who they can put to work and make lots of money from. And what happens again and again is that they find that the people they were actually giving relief to are women, are the elderly, and the disabled. And as a result, they very quickly become you know, relatively benign places. Nobody wants to starve a 90-year-old woman. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It's after the workhouse for you. As you pass through the doorway, your body changes. Your hair grows long. Chest expands. There is a big bump on your stomach. The person I always come back to is, is, is a woman named Jane Brown. She was a 17-year-old prostitute living um, near Covent Garden. And she got pregnant. She had nowhere to go. She had no family. She had no resources. And so what she did was she waited until just before she was due to give birth. And then she simply presented herself at the door to St. Clement Dane's workhouse. And, of course, there was nothing they could do. The baby wasn't going to wait. 
And so she ended up in a specialist uh, maternity ward in the hospital, giving birth to a very healthy young boy, staying in the workhouse against all the policies of the parish for the next six months. And in effect, she played the system. The poor figure out how the system works and make it work for them. And now you enter a dining room full of thin, hungry little boys. Something reminds you of a book you once read. The boys are being served a horrid-looking soup. One of them, perhaps he is your son, stands up and walks up to the man in charge and holds up his bowl and says, Please, sir, I want some more. Blimey, he wants more. Oliver Twist is the kind of classic example of the objectified pauper. He is a perfect small child thrown onto the seas of an uncaring world. I mean, essentially, Dickens creates half the stereotypes we have of workhouses and, uh, and poverty. There was a whole generation of um, urban argonauts off to the, the, the slums in order to um, find a stereotype to write up for their um, eager readers. It was almost a pornography of poverty. In response, there is a public outcry, and the government is forced to, in turn, respond to poverty. The rich often seem to want to help the poor, but it never seems to change the system. Ahead of you, you see Karl Marx, the founder of communism. You ask him, why are the rich getting richer, but not me? The rich will do anything for the poor, except stop exploiting them. Carl is nice and makes you a cup of tea. You tell him, I want to rise out of poverty, but how can I do this? Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. Karl Marx basically believed that poverty uh, was the result of the capitalist system. The capitalist system being one in which companies are organized for profit and their main motive is to make more profit. And he believed that you could maximize profit by keeping wages as low as possible. You look around for the revolutionary industrial proletariat that Uncle Carl told you about, but you find yourself swept along in a different kind of crowd. Thousands of peasants and freed slaves are going up into the mountains of Brazil. Now you are a follower, a follower of a renegade preacher, Antonio Conciliero, whose teachings combine Christianity, communism, free love, and of course, the end of the world. The reign of God is nigh. He will descend in majesty, cast down the mighty and exalt the sufferers, the poor, He's poor. Antonio Conciliero uh, uh, preached uh, the end of days, thus uh, turning uh, the language of religion into a, uh, uh, a political weapon with economic consequences. Two years later, and you have a new home in a new city of the poor. 30,000 people live here. The Brazilian Republic uh, reacts in order to suppress uh, what was effectively uh, a uh, uh, movement of uh, the wretched of the earth reclaiming their own futures. Quick, man the barricades of the city. Your rifle is old and rusty and you are under attack from the Brazilian army. There are 10,000 troops with machine guns, and yet, their bullets can't kill you. You find the real revolutionary proletariat. You strike, you protest, you fight. Across the world, you overthrow governments, though sometimes you have to settle for equal rights and higher wages. 
the elite doesn't just give way. Mass improvements, I think, come from people organizing themselves. The poor get the poor out of poverty. You are on your way up in the West. The government builds sewers and installs water pipes. <sighs> Sanitation is better than revolution. What did begin to change in the industrializing countries uh, in the middle of the 19th century was a rise of real incomes, uh, even uh, in the working class. World wars come and go. There's even the Great Depression. But you still feel things are getting better. Now there are suburbs, motor cars, fridges, vacuum cleaners, TVs. It's difficult to work out exactly what is reducing poverty. How did they achieve that? That's the uh, interesting question. Science and technology. Social housing. Agricultural productivity. Revolutionary movements. A bit of uh, free market ideology. Growth was very fast, and we don't really understand why suddenly growth catches up somewhere. Economists are just not able to predict, like, you have to do this, 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 and this, and growth will catch up. There is no, like, kind of formula that helps to do that. When it happens, if it happens, then, you know, a lot of problems get solved. You're on top of the world again. But time has moved forward to present day. You look down and you can see the same things you saw in Europe and America. Now in India, China, Latin America. There are industrial zones, modern hospitals, apartment blocks, and theme parks. Poverty is on the way out, slowly but surely. There are fewer people who live under a dollar a day today than five years ago, than five years before, than five years before. It's very unequal in some countries more than others, but it's kind of happening. You toss and turn in your sleep. You think while fewer people are starving, there is still a massive underclass servicing the rich. Why are they still there? You want an answer. You are on the palm trees, and beyond the tall mountains lies the glittering ocean. In the distance, there are some things you have never seen before. By the end of the 19th century, there was already a sustained movement out of poverty for those parts of the world that were industrializing. That, of course, begs lots of questions. What about the rest of the world? What was happening? Was it improving their uh, standard or not? What did uh, the colonial era mean? We see a world of uh, uh, inequality in which uh, uh, you, s you have uh, Europe uh, as uh, the center of uh, accumulation of wealth and power, uh, and the rest of the world being uh, uh, progressively submitted to its rule. Africa's poverty has deep roots. The slave trade devastated societies and devastated the continent. Africa stood out with the intense poverty, with the lack of infrastructure, uh, with the massive disease burden, It's a busy market and you are selling cloth. People are paying you in beautiful shells. These are what you have used for centuries as money. Every time you sell a garment, you put more shells in your jar. Then the colonial police arrive. They don't like your money. Carry shells, for example, was an important form of currency. It was one of the local currencies that colonial governments tried to make illegal. So irrespective of how wealthy you are, and if you dealt in trade, you dealt in textiles, or you are a former slave owner or whatever, you had loads of carry shells, you found out that it had become rubbish. 
essentially overnight. The whole of the European imperial project was about creating an international global system that, in economic terms, creates the poor. And that is the origin of that notion of the third world. Look, your skin has turned a shade of brown. You are in a camp somewhere else. A month ago, you were a starving Indian farmer. But now, you are a starving forced laborer. Plus, you have cholera, which is bad news. That train goes past on a new railway built by the British. A cloud floats off it. A cloud of wheat. Something to eat. You realize the train is full of grain destined for export. Poverty is the worst form of violence. The 1876 Southern Indian Famine was in part an issue of simple bad weather. There was a harvest failure, but it didn't need to be a famine. You had a situation where people were starving and still exporting grain. A lot of southern Indian grain was being shipped as far away as, as Britain. Huge amounts of food were shipped out of India that could have fed the six to 10 million um, people who eventually died. You serve alcohol to the poor black workers of South Africa. Once, they were farmers. But the white man took their land away. By day, they go down to the mines. In the evening, they talk about a system that made them poor because of the color of their skin. The 1913 Land Act made it difficult for South Africans to buy land. And what it did would be to set aside large tracts of land for white South Africans. Blacks were needed in cities as labor. You did not have to provide housing for African families. You didn't have to pay them a, a living wage. Women would take in laundry. They would cook food. They would brew beer. That is how gradually we begin to see all these shanty settlements in the proximity of cities. Look into the glass into which you are pouring a bottle of homebrew. Images flow through it of the coming 30 years of history. There are swarms of tanks, bombing raids, concentration camps, then happier images. New flags are flying, black people cheering. After the birth of the United Nations, you have the onset of, of, of nationalism in both Africa and Asia, and the birth of new nations. So India, 47, and the rest, the Gold Coast in Sub-Saharan Africa in 1957. All these become members of the United Nations. And so issues such as the end of colonialism, the relative wealth and poverty of nations are discussed within the U.S. Oh, you look different. You are wearing a dress of expensive fabric and surrounded by men in suits. You are no longer poor. Instead, you are the future leader of a poor country. You've come to hear a speech. More than half the people of the world are living in conditions approaching misery. They're handicapping a threat both to them and to more prosperous areas. For the first time in history, humanity possesses the knowledge and skill to relieve the suffering of these people. A new chapter in the history of poverty is beginning. The world is now divided into rich countries and poor countries. The rich countries at long last admit they have to help the poor ones. 
If you look at the way in which people were thinking in the 40s and 50s, the idea was that we could create a working system that addressed poverty across that whole global economic system. Oh, a lift. Press the highest button. The roof is like an airport. Planes are flying overhead, and helicopters are taking off with full cargoes of air. There are loads of new seeds and medicines. In the 50s and 60s, coordinated international efforts to develop a better variety of cereals, which could grow in particular in Asia, really increased the, the, the productivity of the land. And so the Green Revolution really took hundreds of millions of people out from the brink of starvation, uh, uh, turned India from a, a country which didn't have enough food to a country that actually exports food. The helicopters blow a strong wind that drives you backwards towards the elevator. This time there are only two buttons, China and Africa. You press the China button. You join a queue on a giant communal farm. In time for Chairman Mao's great leap forward. Mao was very concerned, not with the poverty of individuals and their families, but the poverty of the nation as a whole, and wanted to raise China's um, economic status. Poverty gives rise to desire for change, desire for action, desire for revolution. The idea was um, that we don't need foreign aid, we don't need um, lots of capital investment, because China has lots of people. And so if all the people in China could be put to work on these large-scale projects, surely China could be just as productive as the advanced industrialized countries. Look down at your hands. You are holding pots and pans and metal farming implements. Everyone else's hands are holding the same thing. Ahead is a big fire. In order to make uh, China productive in steel, he said everybody should have their own steel furnaces in everyone's so-called backyard or every commune's backyard. And so each uh, commune was under strict orders to produce a certain amount of steel. Um, and uh, people didn't have the means to do this. They were told they could melt down their pots and pans was terrible, unusable, most of it. <laughs> nothing left to cook with, but that's okay because there's nothing to eat anyway. Mao's Great Famine, or the Great Leap Forward Famine, was the uh, horrible outcome. It was a cataclysmic event which had an enormous uh, mortality toll. The accepted figure now is 30 million excess deaths over three years. If only you had pressed the button in the elevator marked Africa. And there it is again. Run for it. Press the other button. You are shown to a seat at a big table. A black man, surrounded by white businessmen. They all address you as Mr. President. We got it was the first independent African country and it had a great leader, Kwame Nkrumah, um, from 1957. Ghana, your beloved country, is free forever. The um, aid piled in at that stage, a lot of credit from private companies, as well as uh, aid from the West. It is clear that we've received, as a continent, enormous amounts of aid. The outcome, or the results, are questionable. They want to help you build factories in your young country, which they say will make your people rich. One man says, first, you have to build the biggest dam in the world. Then another says, we will help you by lending you millions of dollars. All you have to do is promise to pay it back at a huge rate of interest. They built this huge dam, the Volta Dam, and created this entire new lake. Ghana, Ghana, 
The idea was that Ghana would become the world leader of aluminium refinery and bauxite, and it was really a sort of brave new world idea. So they did produce the raw material, but it wasn't very efficient, and the returns from that were abysmal. The belief was very much if we could just give the countries more resources, undertake the right projects, build the biggest dams, uh, then trickle-down economics would work. Uh, the economy would grow and the benefits would go to everybody. Africa and much of uh, the developing world accumulated debts, money that should have been grants in the first place were loans instead. Uh, when uh, these countries couldn't repay these loans, they were really put through a squeeze by the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, development ideas went out the window. Big projects usually fail. The debt prevented Ghana growing for the next 20 years. Poor Nkrumah was thrown out of power. Soldiers have come into your offices and they are forcing you to flee. You are chased. As you run, you see terrible sights. There are children with Kalashnikovs, amputations, rapes, massacres, famines. Those famines aren't about you know, the lack of food in the world. They aren't frequently, as in Somalia at the moment, not even about lack of aid. We know that the harvest is going to fail in Eastern Africa once every 12 or 15 years. If you have a working state, and your harvest fails. You raise the cash and you buy in food and you ship it in and you make sure it's distributed. You don't allow people to starve. There is a formula of capitalism plus welfare state minus civil war equals poverty reduction. Well, I guess at it, its most simplest, <laughs> that is the case. If you can get it, you don't always get it. You know, you often get capitalism without a welfare state, a welfare state without successful economy, and either way, then you're stuck. There are ever greater contrasts. Slums spreading outwards and skyscrapers zooming upwards. Refugees fleeing across bridges and highways packed with new cars. Oceans full of container ships, camps full of starving families. You go down to take a closer look. You are appearing in a TV game show. It's called, Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? The host chats to the first competitor. You're a lady from Bangladesh. She's a lady from Bangladesh who borrowed money from a microfinance bank at low rates of interest, which she used to invest in her street star. You and now, she runs a supermarket. The most important way of getting out of poverty is make, to make sure that everybody can earn their way out of poverty one way or another. Lula, the ex-president of Brazil. He was born into poverty, and he had some ideas about how to help others out of it. Brazil had had widening inequality. Um, one wondered where their society was going. They first began by investing uh, heavily in education, trying to provide incentives to make sure that parents uh, sent their children to school. Um, and these programs break the nexus of poverty. Then the host chats to you, the contestant from China. Your name is Zhang Qinghao. You were a poor farm laborer who went to the city and started selling ice lollies. And in 20 years, you built that up into China's largest drinks company with a drink called Future Cola. China, over the last 30 years, has shown that uh, it is possible to make major dents in poverty, to really bring it down. Uh, several hundred million people have moved out of poverty in China. And now, the question for you on which the billion dollar prize rests. What reduces poverty today? Is it A, A, B, communism, C, state spending, or D, globalization? globalization. 
the kind of mobility that's possible, both geographic mobility and social mobility, is something welcomed even by the very, very poor people who go to the cities, who you know are construction workers and don't get paid and get abused. And uh, you hear all of these stories. Why are they there at all? They're there at all because it gives them an opportunity, at least, however cruel and uncomfortable, to better their circumstances. If you're uh, mentioning the fact that an important number of people have uh, been lifted out of poverty in Burton Commons in China, you need to also take into account the fact that they have had to migrate from their uh, traditional communities in order to work in inhumane conditions uh, in uh, factories in China. I'm sure uh, that uh, working uh, in uh, such conditions is not something that anyone in the right mind would call, uh, you know, getting richer. Hmm. It's still so difficult to decide. But you go for globalization. The host says that, that is, is the, the correct. correct. But before he can finish his sentence, a riot erupts across the TV set. Bolivian farmers are protesting that their water supply has been sold off to a private corporation. Also, ich will nicht sagen, dass dass die Globalisierung eine schlechte Sache ist. Die Frage ist nur, unter welchen Regeln. Was wir jetzt haben, ist Regeln, die von den Reichen für die Reichen ausgearbeitet worden sind. Kapital kann ohne weiteres überall hinfließen, überall kann es frei sich bewegen und äh, hier investieren, dort investieren und so weiter. Aber Arbe Arbeitskraft kann das nicht. Also ein armer Inder, der seine Arbeitskraft zum Beispiel der gelernt hat, wie man Haare schneidet und seine Friseurtätigkeit in Deutschland oder in Amerika ausüben möchte, der wird nicht reingelassen. There is a very long queue in front of an embassy. You want a visa. You fill out a form that goes on and on, page after page. Ich würde sagen, dass äh, also wir heute eine ganz andere Art von Armut vor uns haben als in der Vergangenheit. Die äh, Geschichte der Armut hat hier eine wirkliche Wandlung vollzogen, weil eigentlich alle Armut heute sehr leicht vermeidbar wäre. Die ärmere Hälfte der Menschheit hat heute unter 3% des globalen Haushaltseinkommens. Daran sieht man schon, dass die Armut vermeidbar ist, denn es ist ziemlich klar, dass man die Welt so reorganisieren könnte, dass die ärmere Hälfte mal sagen 5% hat. Das wäre schon eine ganz erhebliche Verbesserung der Situation, die wenigstens die absolute Armut äh, beseitigen würde. You give the form to a man who tears it up in your face. And now you are on an endless ocean, in a tiny boat. You are escaping from your poor country to a rich country. But as you look down, you see that the ocean is full of banknotes, flowing from your homeland towards the place where you are going. Die gesamten äh, Ausflüsse aus den armen Ländern werden auf ungefähr 1000 Milliarden US-Dollar geschätzt. Das entspricht ungefähr acht bis zehn Mal der gesamten offiziellen Entwicklungshilfe, die in diese Länder hineinfließt. Und ich glaube, dass eine Reform dieses Systems mehr zur Armutsvermeidung beitragen würde als die gesamte Entwicklungshilfe. Die Dinge müssen verändert werden, so wie sie in Washington, in Genf, in den Metropolen der Welt ausgehandelt werden. Und diejenigen, die am meisten Grund haben, auf Veränderungen hinzuwirken, kommen an diese Städte und diese Hebel der Macht gar nicht heran. And now you find you have that job in a rich country, in a rich company an auction house. But you're just an unpaid intern. Your job is to carry out the paintings at the auction. This one is Edvard Munch's The Scream. We don't know which way it's going to go. Will the world become more divided? Will climate change, uh, uh, rising world populations, rising tensions, uh, rising inequalities uh, actually create a growing uh, underclass in the rich countries uh, that begins to mirror the underclass in the poor countries? The bidding is running into tens of millions. A 
Every time the auctioneer brings down his hammer, you hear the painting scream and see another apocalyptic future. World recession, global warming, a virus with no cure. And then you wake up. It was only a dream. It's time to get up and go out. You walk out the front door. You are walking down a street in a modern city amidst a crowd. They are marching. There was an idea called trickle-down economics. If you could just get the economy to grow, everybody would, would benefit. Sometimes a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, that's nonsense. It's not true. There's been a remarkable increase in inequality. So it's not even stagnation we're talking about. We're talking about very marked declines of people at the bottom. You start off with a problem, and the minute you get the solution right, the middle classes and the rich pile in and take all the resources. The rich get richer while the poor uh, get poorer. When that becomes a widespread perception, that could have severe consequences for our economic and political stability. You turn a corner, you see a house. It's my house. Your house. These are all the things you own. All the things I own. And this is your mirror. My mirror, mirror, mirror. And it's like a moment from a dream, except it's real. And now you are poor. I'm 